I don't know. See what happens. Okay. Here I am. I can't do that. I don't have to do it now. It's fine. Let's see, part of the issue is this clock might be off a little bit. Let me try to sync it up here. 150 cents. Actually, that's pretty accurate. Okay. Cortisar. Cortisar. Ms. Dunstan, Victoria Dunstan. Yes, no, Ms. Dunstan, no. Ms. Eppaheimer, 
George Eppheimer, good. Gartner, Gartner, okay, Gartner. Usually, I think she sits here. Who's Chris Cabbage? Yeah, okay, but it's still. There's Kratz, Kratz, Lily, Kratz, yes, no. No, I got her, Ms. Leonard, yep, she's right here, okay. Ms. Maciak, Avery, Maciak, Maciak, Avery, nope. Isabel Morgan, Morgan, Ms. Morgan. Is Rentschler, Arizona, Rentschler, there you are. I should remember that, okay. And Ms. Shaw, Emily Shaw, okay. And Ms. Waits. Ms. Waits, oh, there she is, okay. And yes, I skipped over people because I already have your name and your face in my head. So I, I know you're here, so I already marked you down. As, so you're not absent, you're fine. So I apologize, that means the people that I have to ask, it still isn't getting in for a reason or two. So it'll take some time, sometimes it does. Well, it's good to see you all. Da -da -da -da. Thought that I would begin with a reading, not from a Jewish text. Well, actually, it is kind of a Jewish say, um, as we'll find out later, but certainly a text about a Jew whom you may have heard of. This is a reading from the Gospel of John, a scene where this man, Jesus, a Jew encounters a Samaritan woman. Remember the Samaritans that I talked to you about who were in existence in Israel, and they have a conversation. So Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Why is this mentioned? Because typically, even though, because the Samaritans were considered heretics, apicorsis is a word that Jews use for heretics, they would not even, very devout Jews would not even pass through the land where they lived, would not even walk on the very ground. They would cross over the Jordan River and go on the other side of the river. But Jesus has to, so Jesus has to pass through for some reason. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given to one of his sons. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. So I've never been to Israel. I was hoping to go in the future, but because of COVID, it's not going to happen. Nevertheless, from what I understand from people who have been there and know the weather, noontime is very hot. So I imagine that Jesus was kind of sweaty. A woman of Samaria came out to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for a drink? For, as the author tells us, Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans, which would make sense because the Samaritans didn't keep all, like maybe the kosher rules or some of the rules, the ritual rules that the, the Jews did. And so, it was hard to mix with them because they might get ritually unclean, impure. But Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you running water. It's translated as living water, but it means like running water in a, in a brook or a stream or out of a tap. The woman says to him, sir, you do not even have a bucket and the well is deep. Where then can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? Remember the connection between the Samaritans and the Jews and their history. Who gave us this well and drank from it himself with his children and his flocks? Jesus, the Jew, answered and said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. That water, I the water I shall give, will become in that person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so she says, give me the water, <laughs> you know, give it to me, you know, so I don't have to come back to the well. And then their conversation continues. 
our answer, she says to him, I can see that you are a prophet. Our, and this is interesting because the Samaritans also have a belief of kind of like a Messiah figure, just like the Jews, but they call it the prophet. It's not so much the Davidic king, because remember they separated from the, the, the Davidic kingdom, the Southern kingdom. So they have an idea of a prophet like Moses will come into the, will come in the future, similar to the idea of the Jewish Messiah. So she's saying, I see you're a prophet, wink, wink, maybe. But our fathers worshiped on this mountain. I showed you the mountain in the picture of the Samaritans worshiping there. But you people say, i.e. the Jews, that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people, meaning the Samaritans, worship what you do not understand. We, the Jews, worship what we understand because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth and indeed, the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Christ is coming. The Christ. The one called the anointed. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. And she becomes a believer. Why do I read this? Be not just because there are many connections with the belief systems that we've been talking about, but understanding Judaism can help Christians understand where they came from and understand Jesus more accurately than you might otherwise understand him. I love that statement that Jesus says salvation is from the Jews. Yes, because Jesus, as a Christian, I believe that Jesus is our salvation. And we are now entering into what? What period of time in the church calendar? What's going on in the Christian world right now? Nothing. Well, I fasted and abstained yesterday for no reason. That's what Eastern Christians do. They don't have an Ash Wednesday. We, the first day of Lent, we fast and abstain. Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, the great time of fast. It's also the beginning of the time when Jews themselves are preparing and preparing for the, in the next month or so when the great event of Passover will happen. So we as Christians are remembering, preparing for the time of our Savior to remember what he did for us. And I thank you, Holy God, that you have sent the Savior from your people, the Jews, to bring salvation to us. And may you bless the Jews who have been faithful to you and are still faithful to you in his name. I pray. Amen. Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, always, always, especially as we talk about the Holocaust today, no Jesus without Judaism. No Jesus without the Jews. We owe, I as a Christian, owe them a debt, a great debt. Now, tomorrow is Ash Wednesday. For those of you who are Catholics, as you may know, mean means don't eat meat. And this is yes, here we are. Haskalah, Zionism, good. So I want to go back. Don't eat meat. And because it is a fast day, what does fast mean? It means you can eat three small meals, but they should be considerably smaller than a normal meal. If you want to go to full Monty and try to hurt, push yourself and have as little as possible, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an obligation, a, a church obligation, okay? It's not from Jesus, it's not in the Gospels, whatever. It's a discipline that's enacted by the Catholic Church um, as a sign of repentance, changing one's life. And that can include giving up things, but more important is doing things. Maybe for me, it's trying to change the way I interact with family members, you know, don't be so grumpy and grouchy towards them. Try to forgive people I have a grudge against. Those are maybe better than what food I do or do not have. Nevertheless, I still observe 
the laws of abstinence fast. So Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, and then every Friday during Lent, of course, for Christians is a day of abstaining from meat products. In the East, we have to abstain from meat and dairy. Ugh. Ugh. I like milk in my coffee, so that is a suffering for me. I finished with Zionism, yes. And now I'm going into the next major event after Zionism, which brings us to the end of what is called the modern period for Judaism, the Holocaust from 1933, 1945. You might notice that the period of the Holocaust actually extends sometime before, before World War II, okay? The, the Jews are being actively persecuted in the country of Germany for several years before World War II actually happened. And what year did World War II start? The Second World War. Who would like to tell me? Like Bret Hart, you know? Not really. Also not really. <laughs> no one wants to tell me? No? Nobody knows? Okay, oh, well, I guess I'm working on my own. 1939, 1939. But the Holocaust is dated from before. It's called the Shoah, as you can see on the PowerPoint, a Hebrew term that was applied later to the event by the Jewish community, which means a calamity, a disaster, a calamity or a disaster. It's also sometimes called in Hebrew the Kurban. Sometimes you'll hear this Kurban, which means destruction. And you'll also see it sometimes spelled without the C or with, with the C. I prefer the CH because it's a, it's a letter in Hebrew, which is a sound, a trip sound. Um, so it's not really an H, but there's another letter for H that's also in Hebrew. So not to confuse the two, Ket. Kurban, destruction, and in English, Holocaust, which is, again, a religious term. A Holocaust is a whole burnt offering. You burn up the whole victim, the whole animal, or the thing that you offer. You put it into the fire, and all of it is given to the god. Nothing is retained for the, for the use of the priest or the people who offer the animal. So it's a Holocaust. Holos means whole in Greek. So a whole burning of the of the uh, sacrificial victim, and that term was chosen by the Jewish community because of one of the awful um, characteristics of the the persecution. Ultimately, was because there were so many dead bodies that the Nazis would just stuff them into ovens and burn them up because they. Well, one, they wanted to get rid of evidence, but other, the other thing was they had nowhere to, they weren't going to bury them and they needed to get rid of them. So the Holocaust, it was like a religious offering to God, these poor Jewish people being burned alive. Why should they burn alive? Excuse me, burned to death. Their corpses burned up. Even that's not right. Their corpses burned up. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. I'll get it eventually. Adolf Hitler is considered the architect, um, or at least the, the person who gets this process going. I guess it's not probably not fair to call him the actual architect, but he gets the he has the ideas. And then there are other people within his political party who are the actual architects with the hands-on, the hands-on ability that start doing the process of the Holocaust. You can see his dates. He was born in 1889. He died in 1945 by suicide as allied armies were um, coming upon him where he was. He was a German of ethnicity, but he was actually not from Germany. Adolf Hitler was an Austrian. He was born in what's called the Austrian Empire. There was, there was a union between the countries of Austria, or I should say the, the monarchies, the, the rulers of Austria and Hungary at one point. And so there was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had two parts, Austria and Hungary. And he was born in the Austria part, but he was of German ethnicity, although not of nationality. 
I'm not going to give his whole life story, um, only what's really relevant to the history of Judaism. Eventually, he joins a, a political group that would later be called, it was not called this originally, they changed the name later, that would later be called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the ND, NSDAP, NSDAP. N S D A P. The National Socialist. Well, actually, it's in German, but National Socialist German Workers Party. Okay, it's in German, but it works out. Anyways, otherwise known in, in short terms, the Nazis, the Nazis from National National and Sozialistisch, which means socialist. So they, that's kind of like a little short form way rather than having to say the whole term in German, just say Nazi, the National Socialists. Or the NSDAP. So he joins them. In 1925, he publishes his famous or notorious work, depending on how you look at it, um, called Mein Kampf, which in German means simply my struggle what is his struggle? It's, you know, basically his struggle was to reinvigorate and to uh, resurrect in a way, reestablish Germany's prominence within Europe. Germany had been devastated by the First World War. And so he wanted to, to bring um, Germany back to full strength. And the way to revitalize German society in his mind, in his mind, the best way to revitalize German society was to organize it according to race. So Germany, Germany for Germans, Germany for those with a German race. The Jews are not German in his view. They're not part of the race of Germany. Hence, the Jews must go, as other groups must go, like gypsies and, and other groups that are not seen as really being part of the German people. So the Jews must go. That's basically the upshot of his book, Mein Kampf, published in two volumes and was very popular, gave him some fame. Eventually in 1944, he was actually able, you know, he moved up the ranks in his own party, the Nazi party, and eventually the Nazis were able to take over the government of Germany and he himself was able to become der Führer, the leader, that's all it means, it means lead, you know, to lead uh, in German. So he becomes the leader of Germany, but really an absolute leader, almost like a dictator, a total control his word basically was the law. And that's when, that's when, especially when he becomes the leader, that Jew targeted persecution begins. He's, he's able to start putting his plan and those who agree with him are able to help him start putting his plan, his vision into place, which is to isolate and ultimately get rid of the Jews, move them out. Well, originally move them out was the view but uh, that changes. It doesn't become just moving Jews out of German territory, but now we need a solution. The, the Jews are a problem that need a solution, an ultimate solution, a final solution. It's the Judenfrage in German, the question of the Jews, always for the Nazis, the question of the Jews, what do we do with them? And then as World War II starts, because Germany starts invading, well, before that, Germ Germany also started kind of taking over, what well, kind of, so they're taking over other areas of Europe, like parts of what is now the Czech Republic. And, um, but eventually when they, Germany invaded, invaded Poland and other, uh, other countries, um, it was to the, the Jewish question um, grew from just Germany and the German race to wherever the German race could now extend. I mean, their vision went beyond Europe, even to the world. And the Jewish question remained, wherever, wherever we can go, we need to have a, something in place, an apparatus in place to gather up all the Jews in whatever regions we can conquer and then move them somewhere, get rid of them. So certainly all the Jews in German-occupied territory, 
but the final solution also included wherever the Germans were hoping to conquer. And they did. And the ultimate end to that was that millions and millions of Jews were killed. They were rounded up. They were sent to concentration camps and killed. The numbers there, roundabouts between five to six million Jews in Europe were killed. So it was a great amount at the time. It was a great amount of uh, the number of Jews that were living in Europe at the time. If I remember correctly, the number was around, estimated to be around nine million. So after World War II, there's three million. They all went somewhere, because <laughs> you know, I know if you go on the internet, you find sometimes people that say, oh, you know, there were no concentration camps and none of this really happened, or it was on a very minimal level or something like that. Well, okay, fine, but the numbers don't lie. You know, five to six million people seem to just vaporize in a matter of years. Where are they? Where are they hiding? So it does seem that, yes, they were killed, and of course, we have the camps. We can see the ovens, you can see the dead bodies, as you can see here, I mean, just piled up, waiting to be burned. So I doubt it's a conspiracy. Here are a couple of quotes, one, relate, one just taken from Hitler's. It's interesting that, because I, I was curious, I, I searched for references I thought, you know, what would he think about, you know, Jesus the Jew? You know, so I'm a Christian, I'm interested. Adolf Hitler was not a Christian, by the way, far from it. Um, that doesn't mean that Christians didn't support him in Germany. Some Christians opposed him, but a lot seemed to have supported him. Um, otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did, uh, at least so easily. Nevertheless, he, he never mentions Jesus by name, if I remember correctly. He just me mentions the Nazarene or something like that, or that man from Nazareth. You know, he doesn't, you know, he's very uh, oblique about it, unclear. I don't know why. But when he does mention Jews, this is kind of the typical stuff. Jews are parasites. Sponger. The Jew's a sponger. He's a pernicious bacillus. You know, he's, a Jew is like a virus, a bacterium that invades your body. The Jews have invaded the body of Germany. And, and like anything, we, you know, forget about masks and stuff like that. Get the booster shot, you know, get the vaccine, get rid of it, kill it. They spread over wider and wider areas. The effect produced by the Jews' presence is like that of a vampire. For wherever he establishes himself, the people who grant him hospitality are bound to be bled to death sooner or later. So that's where he's coming from. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he's not a fan of Judaism or the Jews, apparently. And then this next quote is from one of the one I should say of the architects of the of the, the Holocaust, this man Reinhard Heydrich. This is a letter, this is not a letter by him, but this is a letter to him by another person who I think also might have been active, but I don't know if he was as active as Heydrich was. Reinhard Heydrich kind of, you know, got the whole apparatus going for the concentration camps and getting, organ you know, organizing the groups that needed to be sent there. Um, I believe later he was assassinated, but he, he, so we didn't see it all the way through, but he certainly got it going. Um, he was given orders. He was told that was his job and he did his job. Um, and Goering is writing to him and he says, complimenting, this is a little memo, a little note, you know, complimenting, complimenting the task that was assigned to you, which dealt with arriving at a solution to the Jewish problem. He doesn't say Jewish question here, but Jewish problem, as advantageously as possible. So efficiently, what's the, what's the most efficient way to get the Jews out of German-occupied territory, and certainly Germany? And so I charge you with making all necessary preparations in regard to organizational and financial matters for bringing about a complete solution of the Jewish question and the German sphere of influence in Europe. Notice it's not, well, notice it's 1941. So this is after various, you know, Germany has started to expand. So it's not even just within the borders of Germany itself, you know, it's now wherever we can occupy France, well, they didn't occupy Italy, but when the Germans hooked up with Mussolini, um, yeah, Italian Jews were then in threat because Muss Muss I don't know if Mussolini had the same antipathy towards Jews and Judaism, but certainly he allowed the Nazis to round them up. And other places, Poland, where the, the Nazis invaded, they you know, took out 
you know, they started systematically exterminating all the Jews they could find. I'm not um, focusing here on Judaism, but of course there were millions of other people who were, were killed as well. As I mentioned, I mentioned the gypsies before, they were certainly not liked by the, Ju uh, excuse me, not liked by the Germans, um, homosexuals, the disabled. Um, so there are other groups, but certainly the focus, there, there wasn't an end solution to the gypsies. There was no gypsy question. There was though, a, Ju a Jew question, a Jewish question, and a solution that needed to be the solution that needed to be given to it. So that is a major event. And the Holocaust explains what comes after, which is the state of Israel period. 1948, after the Second World War concludes, just after it concludes in 1945, but several years after, you have for Judaism what is called the state of Israel, the founding of a nation state that is of, Jew, of Jewish origin. What is the background to this? Well, it's an extremely complicated, as with many things historical, it's extremely complicated, not just because in this case you have the Holocaust as the immediate background, um, but it's, it's also debated, uh, the historical, what happens during this period of the establishment of the state of Israel is debated. You know, there's an Israeli side, there's a Palestinian Arab side, and there's an, you know, the outsiders as well. It includes the British um, as well, who were involved in this, in this uh, time period. But what happens? After World War I, World War I, 1914 until 1918, you had World War I, um, and you had this thing created called the League of Nations, which is the, uh, which is the uh, predecessor to the United Nations. But since the League didn't seem to do a very good job averting another world war, they kind of, you know, closed it down and started the, the uh, United Nations, which also doesn't seem to be good <laughs> at averting wars, but anyways. The League of Nations after World War One, and World War One was from 1914 until 1918. Okay. Well, during after that time period, the or after the time of the second or first World War, excuse me, the first World War, the League of Nations um, determined to give the region that is modern day Israel called Palestine. Um, decided to give that region into the control of the British. They were given a mandate. They were given a mandate. They were given kind of the, the uh, authority to control that area of the world until basically they figured out what to do with it. Okay. Um, what were they going to do with it eventually? Um, because it had been part of what was called the Ottoman Empire, and I'm not going to go into all of that, okay? Because the Ottoman Empire basically crumbled with World War One, fell apart. Uh, if you remember your history of World War One, the Ottoman Empire, which is usually associated with the modern country of Turkey, but it was larger than that, um, was one of the belligerents, was one of our enemies in World War One, the United States, when we entered after we entered the war, and so that was no more. I mean, that was all destroyed with. This First World War. So one of the regions that the Ottomans had control over was Palestine. So the League of Nations gave that region of Palestine to the British to have control over, and as I said, until they figured out what to do with it. So it was a territory with the control of the British. And to make a long story short, uh, you know, the question was, well, what do we do with this? The, someone like Theodore Herzl had been proposing back in the 1800s that the Jews needed a homeland to escape anti-Semitism. Now Herzl died before the Nazis. You know he had no idea about what was going to happen in the future, as you can see from his dates. But with the Holocaust and that incredible genocide, there was a, a, even a greater sense amongst Jews that we need our own place where we can feel protected and protect ourselves from any further genocide, not just anti-Semitism, but deadly anti-Semitism that wants to take our lives away. So that was the feeling. 
What did the British do? Well, the British seemed to vacillate. The British seemed to give conflicting messages. Air, the surrounding Arab leaders, rulers, and, and you know, at that time, you know, kings and local rulers, didn't really want a Jewish state in the region. Um, Palestine was actually a holy place for them, as we'll find out with Islam. Um, and again, there, there very well might have been anti-Semitic sentiments. They just didn't like the Jews and they didn't want them there. Nevertheless, um, the British, so the British seemed, the British government seemed to say, yes, we'll have um, an Arab controlled homeland in Palestine, but to Jewish leaders and groups, they seem to be saying, yes, we'll allow for a Jewish state, but with Arabs in it, who will also be, have, be, have their rights fully respected, all the non-Jewish groups would have their rights fully respected. So there seem, they seem to be giving mixed messages. Well, it didn't matter. Um, in 1948, the year that the British were to hand over Palestine back to the UN, and the UN had a plan. The UN was going to basically divide up, you know, you can go online and look at the maps, it was going to basically divide up Palestine between where the majority Jewish groups were and where the majority Arab groups were. It looks like a mess when I looked at the map on the internet. It, does, it doesn't look like a workable map, but um, nevertheless, they uh, were going to do that. And I, I think that was the, the time, that was the, the last straw where Jews decided, Jewish groups who were in Israel decided that enough of this, we don't need, this is our homeland. We don't need to ask permission of anybody. We're simply going to get together and declare independence, which they did in 1948. As the British were handing over Palestine to the UN, they basically, Jewish leaders basically said, forget about those plans of dividing it up. We're declaring a fully Jewish state, which got the response amongst the surrounding Arab nations that you might expect. There was a war, <laughs> there was fighting. There were battles, which the, the, the Israeli, we call them Israeli groups or Jewish groups, the Jewish um, army or the Jewish, I guess, armed forces, we might say, won. They were able to defeat these surrounding armies these the, of the Arab nations and to establish a fully independent state in what was Palestine. So we have now Israel, it goes from the Palestinian mandate of the British, as you can see with their ensign up there in a little circle. I don't think there was anything ever, any flag officially assigned to Palestine, but this is supposedly a flag that sometimes flew on Palestinian ships to mark them. And then you have the official flag of the new state of Israel with this, which is, as you might know from your textbook, is not really in Hebrew, it's not the Star of David. What is it called? Does anyone know? Might be beneficial to know. So I might have something for you if you remember. The something of David. Not the star of David, although yes, I, I admit it does look like a star to me, but it's actually not called that. It's called Magin Dawid in Hebrew. I'm using the academic pronunciation, just so you know. Magen is not a star, which is kochav, I think, in Hebrew, but anyways. A magen is a shield. It is the shield of David, not the star of David. So the state of Israel is founded, the, a, a, particular, a peculiarly Jewish state. That doesn't mean other people can't be Israeli citizens, but it, it, it is uh, deemed a, a particularly Jewish or particularly a uniquely Jewish state for Jews and to kind of show that fact and emphasize that fact and make that clear um, in a few a couple of years after they uh, the uh, the independence was won 
you had the, the law passed called the law of return, the law of return by the Israeli parliament. It goes, they use, they use the Hebrew word Knesset, which means in, like an assembly or a grouping as well, uh, just as like uh, what you would call synagogue and stuff like that. But a Knesset um, a par it's basically a parliament, the Israeli parliament. The Israeli parliament passed this law that any Jew anywhere in the world has the right to make aliyah, pilgrimage, to come back whenever they want. Okay, they just have to indicate to the Israeli government that they want to come back. And if they are Jewish, then they will be welcomed back as a full citizen. Um, pilgrimage is what the word means in Hebrew. Again, you see this religious terminology, this religious imagery, like a pilgrimage is when you go on a trip somewhere for a religious purpose, for a spiritual purpose, okay? Um, and a pilgrimage is not just the end point where you're going to, a pilgrimage is the whole journey, okay? So you might say, oh, I want to, uh, well, I mentioned before, I wanted to go to Israel. Like I could make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, okay? I get on, but I get on a plane, I fly over there, I take a bus, I'm in a hotel. That whole process is part of the pilgrimage, at least it should be. Time of prayer and reflection about why you're doing what you're doing, why you're wanting to go where you're going, okay? And pilgrimage, aliyah. So Jews, this religious connotation that Jews who are outside of Israel are coming back to their, not just their political, well, not now their political home, but it, it is their spiritual home as well. They are making a pilgrimage, an aliyah. Well, I mean, of course, there were people living in Palestine uh, along with the Jews, the Palestinian Arabs, and many of them had been living in Palestine, Israel for many, many centuries, maybe even a couple thousand years, they had, their families might have been there. So uh, there, there was conflict, what they call the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is ongoing. It's continuing at this time. It hasn't been resolved um, because people felt that they were pushed out of, of, their, uh, of their homes, uh, Arabs, I should say, as, as Jewish uh, Jews came back to Israel and, and moved into places. So that's a whole complicated scene. But from the, era, from the Jewish side, it is seen um, as this return to their homeland, which is not without conflict even amongst Jews. For Muslims, again, I mentioned that for, for the Arab, surrounding Arab nations and for Palestinian Muslims, not all Palestinians are Muslims, though. There, are a lot of, there were a lot of Palestinian Christians. But for them, they feel cut off from Jerusalem. Okay, because now there's a border there. There's the Jewish state, which they have to now get access to. Um, so they might feel they're cut off from Jerusalem, whose sacredness is second only to Mecca for Muslims. So there's a spiritual connection there for them that they feel some Muslims might feel is violated. Orthodox Jews, on the other hand, you have Orthodox Jews who feel like they need to repopulate the Holy Land. This is our land, and we need to move into all those areas that were taken from us by non-Jews, and we start setting up settlements there, setting up settlements. We start establishing settlements and building towns and villages, um, which would you know, be fine, except there are people living there. So what do you do with the people who were living there? How do you get them out of the way? Um, I mean, there's an issue. I remember seeing it on the news throughout Jerusalem, because Jerusalem has different sections, like any city. It's got Little Italy, Koreatown, Greek town, you know, stuff like that. And Jerusalem is no different. It has the Christian quarter, the Jewish quarter, the Arab quarter, stuff like that. And there's been tension because you know, Jewish groups have been trying to buy up any, when people leave or they sell their apartments, they don't really have homes. Um, it's more apartments because it's such an old city. Um, you know, Jewish groups make an effort to keep buying them all up so no one else can get them. The, with the intent, not all Jews, but the intent is again to make Jerusalem a truly Jewish city. And so other groups feel like they're being pushed out. So that, there's that issue of repopulating the homeland. Then there's the Jews. All Jews kind of feel cut off from their history by the fact that they can't rebuild the temple. The temple is there. They've got it now. Okay. Um, but there's a big, huge mosque over it that was built many, many centuries ago. I believe many, many centuries ago. I should, 
so I shouldn't say that until I look it up. But there is certainly at this time a huge mosque built over. And actually, there are little mosques that have been dug into all the foundations of the temple, which is a problem because they're, you know, engineers are, are worried that they might have um, distressed the foundation or harmed the foundation of the, the ancient structure. Nevertheless, so there's all of that. So even the Jews feel like they're cut off. So there, all these issues that are going on there uh, that have been going on in the Arab-Israeli conflict. So that's there. Okay. This is a picture, as I was going to say. There are Jews, believe it or not, who do not accept the state of Israel. You might think it's, oh, oh it's Arab-Israeli conflict, but these are Orthodox. They could also be Hasid Jews, but they do not like, they are anti-Zionists. They are against the existence of the state of Israel, even if they live in the state of Israel. You know, they, they don't have a problem with Israel. They, they, they want to live there. It's their homeland. But there shouldn't be a state of Israel. There shouldn't be an established government in Israel. Why? No, religion. Religion. This idea of, which you might have heard of, the Messiah. And for these Jews, Israel as a political entity cannot be reestablished except by the coming of the Messiah. Remember, he's the descendant of King David, the monarchy, the kingdom. So were the first, you know, the first president or the first prime ministers of the state of Israel, did they have Davidic blood in them? Were they claiming to be the, the, the uh, restoring the Davidic monarchy? No, they weren't. They're establishing a political reality. So they see this as almost like blasphemy because the, the sending of the Messiah should be the work of God. Men and women shouldn't force, try to force God's hand. And so you do, you have contingents of Jews both outside of Israel and even living within Israel who do not, while well, they might live in Israel, they do not accept the government at all. They have nothing to do with the Israeli government because they think that it is, it is, um, well, I say corrupt, but not politically corrupt. They think in religiously corrupt institution because the Messiah, it, is, it implies that the Messiah has come. Ooh. Okay, enough of that history. Moving on to scriptures. Do the Jews have sacred writings? Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> Many sacred writings. Many, many, almost like Hinduism, very many sacred writings that they've. The ultimate sacred writing for the Jewish community is, uh, yes, the ultimate sacred writing is this thing called the Tanakh. The Jews don't have a Bible. I mean, the Bible is a Christian word. So I, I use the word Bible for lack of a better term, um, just so people can understand what I'm talking about. But you should know that really Jews don't refer to the Bible. Okay, that's a Christian invention. And this is a Christian Bible. Okay. Nevertheless, the Tanakh does exist in a certain form in every Christian Bible in what Christians call the Old Testament. There's Malachi. There, okay. So you have the whole first section of the Christian sacred writings is basically the Tanakh. There are, there are differences even between the Christian and the Jewish standard writings, but it's called the Tanakh. Tanakh is taken from these three words, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. One thing I, I, I know about Judaism, they love acronym, acronyms and they love slap. <laughs> no rapper has anything on the Jews when it comes to slap. I mean, all the rabbis have all different handles. And you never know what they're talking because you know the guy's name, but then he's called this, and then he's referred to this in slang. And so it's crazy. You, you think you know something, and then you hear some term um, that's referring to what you think you know, and it, it, you, know, you don't know. For, and, and this is an example, Tanakh. Okay? It's not a word. It's an, an, an acronym. An acronym. What's an acronym? When you take consonants, consonants, the, the, usually the first consonant of each word in a statement, and you use that as the name for the thing. So, well, Nazi doesn't really work. It's not exactly the same type of idea, but something like 
NASA, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration. But instead of having to say all of those words, we simply say NASA, okay? Um, the FBI, okay, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. CDC, that's a big one that's been in the news over the last three years, stuff like that. And in Hebrew, you do the same thing. You take the first, kind of the same thing. You take the first word of each, or excuse me, the first letter of each word, and usually, usually, not all the time, but usually you insert the letter A, ah, the sound ah. So Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, T, N, K, you put ah, Tanak, Tanak. That is the name for the Jewish written scriptures. Why well, should they written scriptures? That's actually a redundancy, but the Jewish sacred writings. And what are they? There are three sections to the Jewish scriptures. First is Torah, the first and the greatest of these writings. Torah is always normative over these other, other sections. But what is it? The word Torah in Hebrew means teaching, but I think more properly it means instruction, actually, than teaching. I think it is teaching in the textbook, but memory serves. The Hebrew is more of an instruction. And that kind of tells you what the focus of the Torah is. What is the focus? Instruction in the law. Okay, not just, you know, basically. I mean, there are other things going on, like telling the story of how the Jews were chosen by God to be a special people. But the great bulk of the Torah, these five books, that I've mentioned before, I'll mention them again. But the great, uh, I mean, the, the main thrust is is uh, recording the law that God gives to Moses and instructing the people on how to follow it. So the Torah, it's made up of five books, which I've mentioned before, but I'll mention them again. Genesis, I will write them all down again, I'll just abbreviate Genesis. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And there are five of them, yes? One, two, three, four, five. Hence, you will sometimes see them called the Pentateuch. And you can see embedded in this term, Pentateuch is the Greek word for five, pente, pentagram or pentacle. I always grew up saying pentagram, but now you're supposed, you say you're supposed to say pentacle, whatever, the five-pointed star, pente in Greek, five, for the five, the five hinges, a true cross in Greek is a hinge. It's actually given, the, it's given incorrectly in the textbook um, when they, they give the, the meaning of Pentateuch from Greek. No, a true cross is a hinge. So it's like a book with a hinge, like a spine. Okay. Um, the Hebrew in Hebrew, sometimes you hear Jews refer to this as kumash, which has the same kind of meaning as Pentateuch. You know, something with a hinge or a spine, like a, a book form of the Tanakh, because the Tanakh is not written as a book. Again, that's a Christian invention. For Jews, it's always a scroll. That's how you read Tanakh. It's on a scroll not written in a book, so Kumash would be a book form, and it's equivalent to saying Pentateuch. So the Pentateuch, the five books. The five books of Moses, where Moses, well, mostly Moses receives the law, except for Genesis, because he's not in Genesis. And traditionally, it's believed that the Torah was revealed to Moses in its totality. Again, you might say, well, how was Genesis revealed to Moses in its totality? Well, Moses wrote it down. You know, the, the, the ancient belief is that Moses wrote all of these books. So he wrote what he was given. He was given the law in its totality. And anything, I guess, that comes before him, he wrote down later from Revelation. But Torah is not just the written words in the, in the book. The Torah also means the oral tradition as well. So there was an, or, again, I told you, there was an oral tradition that is just as revelatory and is authoritative for Jews that was passed on that's not written down in the Bible. 
Okay, it's pa it was passed down by various religious sources, but it's an oral Torah as well um, that will eventually get written down, but not in the Torah. This group of books developed over several centuries, probably beginning with the United Kingdom under David, or probably under, yeah, well, after David, I would say, probably beginning, yeah, with the United Kingdom around the time of David, but receiving its final form, starting to receive its final form around the time of our friend Ezra, Ezra the scribe. So anywhere between the 900s and the 400s BC is when the Torah and perhaps also many of these other writings were being put together. They say 900s and 400s, the rough estimate. Okay, so what does the Torah contain? I've already told you. In Genesis, you have the stories of the patriarchs, the founding fathers of the Jewish people, and the rest of the books are concerned with all of the rules and regulations that Moses receives from God about how these special people are supposed, people are supposed to live. Nevi'im comes from the word prophet. Oops, back to the board. The word prophet in Hebrew is nabi. And the plural up there is nevi'i, nevi'i. So it changes a little bit, just so you know. It changes a little bit. So a nabi is a prophet, and nevi'im are the prophets. Who are prophets? Well, these are men, and there are some women, but we don't have any books from the women. Um, they, these are men who receive visions from God, and they speak to the people of Israel about God's will and they provide interpretations of what's going on in the history of the people. So they're seers, they are seers, not unlike in some ways the Rishi that we find in Hinduism, okay? We see some of these archetypal characters, as, or should I say archetypal or typological? But anyways, we see some of these same realities in, across religions, okay? You have seers and just about visionaries and just about every religion and the Jews are no different. These visionaries passed on messages from God. They had both social and religious functions. They could, you know, uh, start a coup d'etat. Prophets were known to start coup d'etats, but prophets were, I'd say, mostly religious characters fo uh, focusing on the will of God. And the prophets role was oftentimes to remind Jews of their special obligation to God, that their special, uh, that their special relationship with the one God had special obligations. And if they did not fulfill these obligations, then God would punish them. So the prophets were like a bunch of happy guys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When you read, usually when a prophet shows up, it's not a good thing. And you can see this if you read some of their writings. I mean, there are, hap there are happy points and points of jubilation, but a lot of it is saying, you're doing this wrong, change, sinner. And then we have the Ketuvim. Well, something, the Torah was pretty much well established early on in the sacred writings of the Jews. The prophets took some time to develop. So what do you do with something that's not part of the Torah, but also is not really a prophet? Well, that's where you get the ketuvim. Ketuvim literally means things that are written down. Okay, katab in Hebrew means to write. So ketuvim literally means writings, things written down. Katab means to write. So that's where they dump everything that doesn't fit in with Torah and doesn't fit in with the prophets. So it's a grab bag of writings, a collection of things from history books, like the first, books, the first book and the second book of Chronicles, poetry, like the Song of Songs, which interestingly, this is why I always say the Bible is a fascinating book. It's all devoted to sex. The Song of Songs is a, is a hymn, it's a song praising the sexual union of a husband with his wife and vice versa. So we have poetry, the book of Lamentations, it's a book of sad poems, hymns, hymnology in the book of Psalms. Yes, it looks like poetry, but there's songs. The Psalms are songs that were sung perhaps in the temple, sometimes in the, the royal palace. 
You have philosophy, the book of Ecclesiastes, and you have short stories. Short stories, the book of Ruth is a short story, the book of Esther. Okay, so a whole bunch of different stuff is thrown into the Ketuvim. In Torah, you find two sorts of things that, well, I guess I, I'll just give these words to you. I'm connected to Torah, but it is in Torah. But just so you know what I'm talking about, mitzvah and halakha, or in the plural, mitzvot, or halakot. Okay, the plural changes a little bit because um, it's feminine. The other words are masculine. Nabi is masculine. So the masculine plural is im, nabi im. Mitzvah is feminine gender in Hebrew, so mitzvot. Right? So a mitzvah is a commandment, bar mitzvah, yes? Son of the commandment. The boy, the boy becomes a man. He is now a Jewish man. He has rights within the Jewish community. He's, part of, he's one of the witches to now at 13, he has to start observing all the commandments like everybody, every other male Jew. <laughs> Can't we all just stay 13? <laughs> or actually 12, I should say, because 13, well, no, I should say 12. Ooh. And halakha is a law. A halakha is a law in Hebrew. Why does this matter? Well, it will matter in a second when I talk about this. We have the written law. Now we're dealing with the oral law, the Mishnah the Mishnah and the Talmud. What is Mishnah? Repetition. The word Mishnah in English means repetition. Repetition of what? The oral law over and over again. The oral law is passed on by word, by word of mouth from Jewish, I don't, I don't wanna say rabbi because, well, anyway, I'll just say rabbi because it's just easier, easier catch all term. From rabbi, from ancient rabbi to ancient rabbi, they pass on the oral tradition that they believe that Moses received from God on Mount Sinai. Eventually, this oral tradition is collected and it gets written down, and that is what is called the Mishnah. Can I say that for eh, Okay. Who collects it? Well, you already know about him. He's on the PowerPoint again, Judah Hanasi, Judah the Prince. He's, he's one of these ancient sages, these ancient wise men of the period. Um, and he's cr usually credited with being the one who brings together this collection of the, the oral Torah. So what is the Mishnah? It's the oral legal traditions that have, were believed to have been revealed to Moses and passed down, but it also includes the interpretations that are added on to that oral tradition by people like Judah Hanasi and those who were with him at that time period. The people that included Judah Hanasi and the people who were with him who made these additions are the Tanas, or in Hebrew plural, the Tanaim. A Tana is a sage, a wise person, and Tanaim is the plural. I think I'll just say Tanas. You just add the English S on it to be. Not the, whatever. But you should know that when they're talking when they're talking about the Tanaim, it's a group. This group, the Tanas, were these wise men who kept the oral law. And then around the first and second centuries, when Judah the Prince was he was one of them, um, added their own interpretations to the Mishnah. Or I shouldn't say the Mishnah, but added their own interpretations to the oral tradition. And those two coming together. Actually, say should say yeah. Well, those two coming together are generally called the Mishnah. Okay, the Mishnah proper is actually I should say is the oral tradition. The additions of their interpretations is more technically called the Tosefta. The Tosefta. So when you're reading a Jewish writing, the Talmud will get to in a moment, and I'll show you this. Um, usually, you'll have what will stand out first is the oral tradition, which the Tanaim, the Tanas, collected. And then right below it will be the Tosefta, their additional interpretations of these various ancient rabbis that help collect it. And then you'll have other stuff, which I'll mention in a moment. So the Tosefta is an addition, and that's exactly what the word means in Hebrew, an addition. It's an addition to the Mishnah proper, to the oral tradition. 
this moral tradition was organized into six orders, six sections, six sections, based on what they, the oral tradition was, was describing or talking about. Seeds, which is agriculture. I mean, it says seeds, but in general, it's talking about all sorts of agriculture. Festivals, so feast days, women, and just about every religion, women are an issue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's just one of those things that keeps recurring in you know, religion. So, but a whole section devoted to women's issues. Damages, which is more like if you're into law and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if anyone is uh, going into pre-legal or pre-law, but tort, you know, property, stuff dealing with property is what damages deals with, basically. Property issues applying the law to property, holy things, especially the temple, but anything that is sacred and dedicated to God. And then finally, purifications, which involves ritual cleanliness, um, stuff like that, how to stay ritually pure and clean. I, guess, I wonder if washing your hands might be included in this section, but stuff that, you know, that stuff that Jews have to do to cleanse themselves from from not sin, but impurity, ritual impurity. You could still be a good Jew, but you might like have touched a dead body or something. It doesn't make you then a bad person. It just makes you ritually impure. And there might be some might be something you have to do to take that away. So that would be covered in purifications. And then, as I said, you know, to each of these collections where the, the Mishnah was, then the Tanas, the Tana would add their own comments on the oral tradition, the Tosefta. So these two, the Mishnah and the Tosefta, these, everything else after that is basically a commentary on these two things. And the commentary on these two things, the Mishnah and the Tosefta together, is called Talmud. That's where we get to the Talmud. Talmud, um, well, I guess in the, in the things that I've consulted, it doesn't have a proper translation, so we have to go to the root, um, the root letters in Hebrew, and the root letters, Lamed, Mem, and Daleth, have the meaning in Hebrew of to learn something or to study, to study. Okay, so basically that's what Talmud means, a learning, a study, something that is learned or studied. And what is the Talmud? Well, I mean, to me, Basically, the Talmud is a commentary on a commentary on a commentary. <laughs> it's like it, it's 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 a huge commentary on the Mishnah and the Tosefta. Um, so it's a vast collection, of, and it contains the teachings of many, many, many rabbis over the centuries. And it's based on the six sections that we find in the, the, the Mishnah, the original Mishnah, seeds, festivals, women, damages, holy things, and purifications. And so you have the Mishnah and Tosefta, and on, you know, below that in the Talmud, but you know, in addition to it, you have now all these of hundreds, maybe even thousands of different rabbis, uh, their opinions on each of the issues that are raised by the oral tradition and how to follow it. So this is the Talmud is the embodiment, is the ultimate embodiment of the oral Torah that's given to Moses. The written Torah is in the Jewish Bible, but the oral Torah is embodied in the Talmud. And it is second in authority only to the written Torah. So it contains all sorts, I mean, the Talmud contains all sorts of stuff. It contains, of course, legal discussions, discussions of halakha, um, it contains stories, just stories, which are called either Haggadah or Agadah. I've seen both forms and never given a reason why one is used and one isn't, but stories that are called Haggadah, parables, Haggadah, which you'll also see it without the H, Haggadah. And the, you know, basically a Haggadah is a story, it's a parable, think of Jesus. That's exactly, Jesus was Jewish. He was 
considered by some people to be a rabbi. I mean, not technically a rabbi, but and part of uh, you know that is storytelling is, is a way of teaching. It's a, a uh, a teaching device, story. So you find tons of stories in the Talmud, and there's biblical commentary and, and all sorts of other stuff mixed in. So it's it, um, if the if the Ketuvim was a grab bag of material, the Talmud is a grab bag par excellence of all sorts of interpretations. Um, the Talmud does not necessarily distinguish between whose opinion is right. And this is something that can maybe, for some people when they're first exposed to it, can make it in, um, a frustrating thing to read because the purpose of the Talmud and the collection of the Talmud was not to say, okay, Rabbi X is right and Rabbi Y is wrong. So we'll take Rabbi X's interpretation and just plug it in underneath the Mishnah or the Tosefta. No, it, can, it, it contains both majority and ma minority opinions. You frequently come across you know, Rabbi so-and-so said this, such and such, but Rabbi so-and-so demurred and said, no, I don't think so. And, and that's fine. That's perfectly legitimate. That, that's not a problem for Talmudic study. In fact, it should lead the Talmudic scholar, which every Jew is Jewish male at least is supposed to be at some point in his life, um, that should lead him to then try and figure out, okay, well, what's my opinion? You know what? How can these two disagree and why do they disagree? Is there a way out of the disagreement? Or do we just let the disagreement stand and move on? It's not, so you find majority and minority opinions. And the Talmud is not trying to come up with a solution. It's more a record of discussion, a record of discussion about the law than a clear series of rulings and decisions. If you want rulings and decisions, then there are other processes within official Judaism to give you a rabbi's official ruling about, okay, this is how you're supposed to practice this halakha. Don't look for that in the Talmud. The Talmud is more of a discussion, a springboard for rulings and decisions. The people who, uh, now this, this collection of the Mishnah and then the Talmud takes place from the time of the Tana or Tanaim, I'm sure I'll write it here now, in the, beginning around the 100s AD and finds its completion ultimately around the 600s AD. Okay, so this period of what, 500 years, you have the oral, oral tradition collected, codified, and then commentary written on it. So one from the 100s AD until the 600 AD. And the people who bring together the Talmud, okay, they bring together the essential Mishnah, but they also bring together um, their own, inter all these interpretations of the rabbis, their discussions are the Amoras or the Amoraim, okay, the spokesmen, the speakers. Okay. Um, so that's who these people are, this, the, these people called the, the Amora, the Amoras. They are the ones who are finally credited with compiling the Talmud and like the Tanas, adding their own commentary, which is where you find actually the bulk of the Talmud, these huge sections where you have Rabbi X and Rabbi Y, Rabbi A and Rabbi B all arguing and, and disagreeing and sometimes agreeing over what the oral law means. And that edition is called the Gemara. Okay, so the Tosefta edition comes from the Tanaim, the Tanas, these ancient scholars who preserve and write down and compile the um, oral law. But the discussion on that oral law that comes over centuries later is called the Gemara, and that's the, um, the Amoraim commentary, their commentary on the Mishnah contained in the Talmud. So they're seen as the collectors and codifiers of the final Talmud. There are two, ver um, I have a page of the Talmud here, just very quickly. If you look at a page, it's all in Hebrew. It's most likely not going to be in English, although you can find English translations in the public domain. And as you can see, it's a, you know, the, the up here, so Mishnah is in this thing, more or less in the center with you know, the Tosefta part of it. And then I can't really see it exactly. I mean, it's hard to see if I could read Hebrew 
fluently than I can say, oh, right at that point. But at a certain point, it breaks off, I, I guess here, I think it's here, it breaks off, and the rest of this is the Gemara from the Amoras, and everything on the, the edges of the pages are additional commentary from all sorts of additional commentators and rabbis over the centuries, not the Tanaim or the Amoraim, just from other people. And then there are references to scriptural citations, other collections of laws. So it's a very complicated page, for at least for me, to look at. Two versions of the Talmud have come down to us. One from the Jews who were stationed in and remained in Babylon, remember the Babylonian exile, but there is, so there was a Jewish community there, but there's also a Jewish community that survived in Palestine. Remember after the Romans destroyed everything, destroyed the temple and almost wiped out all the Jews there. So we have the Talmud Yerushalmi, which is called Yerushalmi might look like the word Jerusalem. And that's exactly what it means. It's Hebrew for Jerusalem. So it's sometimes called the Jerusalem Talmud, but also commonly called the Palestinian Talmud. And then you have the Talmud Babli, Babylon. So Babli is the word for Babylon. So the Talmud from Iraq, the Babylonian Talmud, Talmud Babli. And so you see where each one kind of happened in Israel, Palestine, and Iraq. You can see the dates around 500 AD, the Talmud Yamashalmi, Yerushalmi seems to have been pretty much formed, brought together. So it's the older of the two. Babli comes a century later. Nevertheless, well, Yerushalmi is incomplete. We don't have all the books of the six orders for Yerushalmi. I believe the last two books are missing in Yerushalmi. And from I, I believe Babli is complete. It contains all the six orders. Nevertheless, regardless, Talmud Babli is the one that has authority amongst Jews today. It has the supremacy. It doesn't mean you can't look at Yerushalmi, Talmud Yerushalmi, but most Jews, when they're looking for an authoritative Authority, well, they're looking for authoritative commentary on the oral Torah, look to the Babylonian Talmud. And you can tell which version, of, just a little thing, if you're ever looking at a quotation, someone cites one of the Talmuds, and they cite something like from one of the books, like say, oh, like a tract, little book called like Sanhedrin or something, and they're citing from Talmud Yerushalmi, they'll tell you by putting usually a little Y in front of it, and then it's the name of the section that they're talking about or where the, the quote comes from. And it'll be like, you know, Yerushalmi Sanhedrin, and you look in column 33, or like, it's not really a, usually a page number, it's like the column of the text. And if it's Bobbly, then they'll put a little B period, Bobbly Sanhedrin 33. So you'll you'll know, just so you don't want to go crazy, like you're looking for Sanhedrin and Yerushalmi, but they mean Babli, and you don't know where it is. Oh, it's there. You're just looking in the wrong Talmud. Okay. I think I'll end there. See uh, you on Thursday. God bless you all. And again. Oh, I don't want to do that, because I got to do it again. La -da -da -dee. Yeah, so yeah, that seems to be that's good. Happy with that. Yes, Ms. Um, Brown Brooks. 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 I just had a quick question. So for my course project, I already went to like the place. Well, it was like the Zen meditation thing. On Zoom? Mm -hmm. Yes. And she just emailed me saying that I attended, but like she didn't fill out the like, form. That's fine. Yeah, because I understand. Yeah, it, because it's on, it's virtual. I understand that it's you can't do it necessarily the way that I might have wanted. So that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So you just want me to like submit like the screenshot of like the email or like. Um, yeah, if you could do that, if you if you can submit the screenshot, you can also. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good idea. I should put that. Yeah, just do that, please. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Alrighty.
Da, 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 da. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Shri Krishna, Tosafo, Kamara. Okay, it's. Hi, Mom. Are you watching? I thought you watched me when I taught. <laughs> 